This podcast is brought to you by the Association for Child and Adolescent Mental Health, ACAM for short. You can find more podcasts and other resources on our website, www.acamh.org, and follow us on social media by searching ACAMH. Hello, welcome to the In Conversation podcast series for the Association for Child and Adolescent Mental Health, or ACAM for short. I'm Jo Carlo, a freelance journalist with a specialism in psychology, and I have with me children's wellbeing practitioner Lucy Jonas, who works at Central and Northwest London NHS Foundation Trust. Lucy is the first author of the paper, A Systematic Review and Meta-Analysis, Investigating the Impact of Childhood Adversities on the Mental Health of LGBT Plus Youth, published in JCPP Advances. This paper will be the focus of today's podcast. JCPP Advances is one of the three journals produced by the Association for Child and Adolescent Mental Health. ACAM also produces the Journal of Child Psychology and Psychiatry and the CAM. If you're a fan of our In Conversation series, please subscribe on your preferred streaming platform. Let us know how we did with a rating or review and do share with friends and colleagues. Lucy, welcome. Can you start with an introduction about yourself, including how you came to be interested in child and adolescent mental health? Thank you so much, Jo. It's really exciting for me to be talking to you today. I'm a children's psychological wellbeing practitioner training at Westminster Camps. So I deliver low intensity therapy to children, adolescents and their parents or carers who are experiencing symptoms of depression, anxiety or behavioural difficulties using cognitive behavioural therapy techniques. I love this role because we are frequently the first level of intervention. So we have a unique ability to improve the lives of young people before their symptoms deteriorate. This interest in mental health came into fruition during my time at school as I studied psychology for A-level. I chose to build upon my interest in this field by studying psychology as an undergraduate degree at the University of Exeter. I graduated in 2020 during the first COVID-19 lockdown, and during lockdown, I felt particularly drawn to the news articles predicting how the restrictions would trigger a global surge of trauma exposure, physical, sexual, and psychological maltreatment, neglect, and unexpected bereavements among vulnerable children. From my undergraduate degree, I was already aware that even before the pandemic, immense pressure was being placed on already stretched mental health services, and too many young people were carrying the burden of mental health conditions without any support. This inspired me to do a master's in child and adolescent mental health at King's College London, where I was lucky enough to have the opportunity to do a placement in a psychiatric intensive care unit, which solidified my professional interest in paediatric psychology. I was supervised by Dr. Kim, an amazing clinical psychologist who has inspired me to follow in her footsteps of becoming a psychologist in the future. Brilliant, Lucy, thank you. Um, Let's turn to the paper, a systematic review and meta-analysis investigating the impact of childhood adversities on the mental health of LGBT plus youth, published in JCPP Advances. Can you give us a brief overview of the paper to help set the scene? So we all know from reports, reviews and even anecdotal evidence that the risk of exposure to a traumatic event escalates for for young individuals from within the LGBT plus community. Just to note, LGBT plus refers to all individuals with minority identities related to sexual orientation, gender expression or gender identity. So this systemic exposure is fertile ground for a number of mental health problems. However, of the existing reviews, the nature and magnitude of the impact of such adversities has only been tested in LGBT plus adult populations, impeding our understanding of the psychological repercussions in adolescents. So this is the first systematic review and meta-analysis to source and review all the existing literature linking multiple types of childhood adversities to mental health outcomes across the full spectrum of LGBT plus youth. Great, so it's really timely and important. What, what, what methodology did you use for the research? So this paper is a systematic review. We conducted a keyword mapping strategy of, on five databases from the date of their creation until the final search in September 2021. Based on initial scoping search, we used keywords related to LGBT plus youth, childhood adversity and psychiatric related health conditions to ensure the search produced all possible results. 
27 studies satisfied the inclusion criteria, representing 26,505 LGBT plus youth. And using this data, we conducted meta-analytical regressions to evaluate the association between the presence of an adverse experience and the presence of mental health outcomes. I was really lucky to be assisted by brilliant co-authors who were involved in study selection, data extraction, and bringing the meta-analysis into fruition. They were all experienced in the performance of reviews, so skilled with statistics, and possess unparalleled knowledge of the topic being addressed. I want to dig into some of the specific findings in the paper, but can you start, Lucy, with a kind of overview of just to share some of the key findings? Yes. The first thing to note is that LGBT plus youth reported a higher prevalence of different forms of adversity in comparison to their heterosexual or cisgender counterparts. The meta-analytical results revealed that 55% of LGBT plus youth were exposed to any adverse experience, with the majority reporting sexual abuse, verbal abuse, physical abuse, or cyberbullying. The upshot of this is that LGBT plus youth are at a heightened risk for mental health disorders, with 23% of LGBT plus youth reporting a mental health problem, which exceeds the worldwide estimated prevalence in the general child and adolescent population, which is 13.4%. In terms of mental health outcomes, anxiety disorders and depression were more than double reported within the LGBT plus sample when compared to their heterosexual group. Gosh. Mm. Uh, the formal meta-analysis also revealed that depressive symptoms were present in 36.9% of LGBT plus youth and anxiety was present in 31.5%. Um, there's something I want to pick up on in the paper. It states sexual orientation disclosure is linked with social anxiety disorder, phobia or PTSD symptomatology. Can you elaborate on this link between disclosure and some mental health conditions? So social anxiety, phobias, and PTSD are all manifestations of anxiety. While the full answer is undoubtedly complicated as to why LGBT youth are more likely to struggle with mental health disorders such as anxiety, disclosing one's sexual or gender identity to others is a unique experience, but common to LGBT plus youth that is often marked by fear. Disclosure of a stigmatised identity unfortunately invites possible rejection from loved ones. Seeing as family, friends and partners might not always offer the love and support that they could, it's not surprising that disclosing this information is anxiety provoking. If the reaction is negative, LGBT plus youth report more physical and verbal violence and there may also be a potential loss of social, emotional and financial support, all of which are predictive of PTSD. In a larger context, it's only been 30 years since homosexuality was declassified as a psychological disorder, and there is still a lack of legal protection from laws worldwide that still criminalise the expression of LGBT plus people. Yeah, that's a really helpful explanation, you know, as to why it's so provoking. As you've already stated, your review found that all outcomes in terms of mental health conditions were more prevalent and statistically significant in LGBT plus individuals compared to heterosexual youth. What are the implications of this for CAM professionals when working with young LGBT plus patients or clients? Yeah, so it's interesting that, well, historically, LGBT plus people have been found to report more concerns with care and communication provided by CAMS clinicians. Due to this long-standing history of poor patient care, fostering inclusive and safe environments in which youth can disclose sensitive histories is crucial. To make key but achievable changes, clinicians should aspire to support young people to feel comfortable disclosing and discussing their identities, establishing confidentiality and educating parents. I think another important takeaway for service professionals assessing and treating children and adolescents is that they may wish to pay particular attention to patients who endorse a sexual or gender minority status and consider the etiological role of trauma in their practice. Due to the overpresentation of adverse childhood experiences within the LGBT plus population, it may be helpful to incorporate assessment of patients' childhood history and to adopt a trauma-formed approach. 
This approach places a strong emphasis on enhancing support systems, mitigating trauma reminders, and fostering safety in a patient-centered way. Having said this, as clinicians approach trauma treatment among LGBT plus individuals, it's important to mitigate running the risk of a one-size-fits-all method, mm -hmm. as it's essential to contextualize their current presentation within their respective environmental histories in a patient-centered way, rather than making assumptions based on their sexual or gender identity. And so I want to turn to schools. Your paper highlights the strong evidence that school-based victimization is causative of mental illness and conversely that the impact can be lessened through relationships with supportive peers. Given these findings, how should schools prepare for working with LGBT plus students? So all students, no matter their background, sexual orientation or gender identity, deserve to feel safe and welcomed in schools. No student should dis experience discrimination or harassment in the classroom. The lack of support in the fabric of many school institutions limits LGBT plus students' rights and leaves them more vulnerable to experiences that may compromise their mental health. With most of the studies in this systematic review taking place in school settings, we found strong evidence that school-based victimisation is causative of mental illness. Therefore, there is an urgent need for establishing inclusive programming in schools to support young LGBT plus mental health. The first method is to provide a compassionate and safe school environment for sexual and gender minority youth. It's so well documented that the impact of childhood diversity on LGBT plus youth can be lessened through relationships with supportive peers, such as peer-based support groups. A peer-led programme to raise awareness to students about cyberbullying towards LGBT plus youth was piloted and successful, allying students, reducing prejudice and harassment in the school environment. Similarly, key adults around school must be vigilant in recognising victimisation efforts and offer a safe space where minority youth feel valued in their choices. To adhere to a welcoming and inclusive ethos, it's crucial that all school personnel utilise correct terminology and implement protection and provision policies for vulnerable students. Teachers should strive to establish rapport with LGBT plus students by, for example, always ensuring they're using a transgender youth preferred pronouns and to allow gender non-conforming children to wear the uniform in a way which is comfortable for them. Do you think that happens at the moment? I think there's definitely a change going forward at the moment. What we found in our paper actually is that victimisation efforts in schools is reducing when we compared studies to decades ago and to now. So I think that's an implication of the policies that are being put in place in schools at the moment. Mm -hmm. Great. In the paper, you call for continued advocacy from communities and allies to support and empower LGBT plus youth in the face of adversity. How do you envisage this happening? What, what should we all be doing? Continued advocacy is definitely required to modify the hostility and violence that has historically been perpetrated towards the community. In terms of what we should all be doing, I think we should all be vocal in our support for LGBT equality. Studies repeatedly identify social support as an important element of countering the possible negative effects of childhood adversities on LGBT plus youth. So every single one of us can play a role in instilling hope in the hearts and minds of the young people, particularly during uncertain and unsettling times. So another idea is to take action at a local level to create safe spaces. I urge you to consider your community and some of the places where the youth might spend their time and wonder, are they safe for LGBT plus youth? And if you work with youth as a teacher, therapist, social worker, or other professional, learn the best practice in creating safe spaces. Are, are there any particular resources for professionals if they don't feel confident about doing this properly? Where can they go? There's definitely an increasing number of services online. Um, the resources that are available just on the internet are growing and they're so incredible, often made by LGBT youth themselves. However, I would really encourage any sort of workers to go to their managers um, and ask for specific training because there are lots of different training courses available. Let's turn to policy makers. What's your message to them? Well, despite clear and persistent evidence that LGBT plus populations are among the most vulnerable groups for mental health problems, 
Stigma has driven this long-standing shortage of funding devoted to LGBT health. I would strongly encourage policymakers and stakeholders to garner adequate funding to address the prevalence of ACEs and to create successful early interventions. It's so important that LGBT plus specific work is continuously reviewed and updated in light of rapid developments in public discourse and academic knowledge. Similarly, the UK government should continue to consult with LGBT plus people and their organisations to ensure work is inclusive of the community's needs. Are you optimistic that that's happening? Yes, well, as I said, society is changing and there does seem to be this shift in public thought and in major legal reforms. Mm -hmm. So I, I continue to be optimistic, yes. <laughs> Good, great. Um, Lucy, what follow-up research or other projects are in the pipeline for you that you'd like to mention? Well, although there's nothing specific just yet, a limitation of this review, which bears emphasis, is that we were unable to conduct a meta-analysis using subpopulations of the LGBT plus community. Where there was once a single well-known rainbow pride flag, today a wide array of colourful flags fly to showcase sexual and gender diversity, and I think this suggests exciting avenues for future study. To extend the research presented here and to conduct a more comprehensive meta-analysis, it would be really interesting to examine um, ACEs and the mental health outcomes of lesser known gender and sexual minorities, because by combining them into a collective group, it can strip the differences in experiences that distinguishes each individual. Mm -hmm. So I think this would be a really interesting piece of follow-up research. Mm, great. Is it something you plan to take on? I would love to, if, if anyone wants to, to join up with me. Finally, Lucy, what is your take-home message um, for those listening to our conversation? So in summary, young LGBT plus people endure disproportionate trauma exposure. They're more likely to experience the profound effects in adolescence, but it's often not noticed during this period and instead the psychological wounds linger into adulthood. If help is available, it's often provided too late and this needs to urgently change. So the paper is a wake up call to reach out and be vocal in your support for LGBT equality. If any of your family or friends hear this, they're more likely to feel confident to be open about their sexual orientation or gender identity. As I said, society is changing, and this is largely as a response to burgeoning global activism, denouncing the systemic human rights violations responsible for victimising the LGBT plus population in the past. This means that many more people can be themselves with people who matter, which is critical for confidence and well-being. So I would tell the person that you love them and appreciate them just the way that they are. What an important message. Lucy, thank you so much. For more details on Lucy Jonas, please visit the ACAM website, www.acam.org, and Twitter at ACAM. ACAM is spelled A C A M H. And don't forget to follow us on your preferred streaming platform. Let us know if you enjoyed the podcast with a rating or review, and do share with friends and colleagues. This podcast was brought to you by the Association for Child and Adolescent Mental Health, ACAM for short.